Good morning once again, and welcome to the Baptist Voice. I am your host, Pastor Joseph Hart, the pastor of the Bible Baptist Church located in Greendale, Indiana, just outside of the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky area. And I want to encourage you and your family, if you are searching for a church home, come and visit with us at the Bible Baptist Church. Look at what God is doing with us and find a place for you to serve the Lord with your life so that you can bring honor and glory to him. And not just bring honor and glory to him, which is our number one goal, our number one goal. But secondly, loving and helping and encouraging your neighbor as God encourages us to do. Well, today I'd like for us to take our Bibles and go to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. And we do hope that this new year is finding you well. Here we are the first week into February, and we thank God for his goodness of the past week, taking care of us, watching over us, expressing and extending his mercy to us. I tell you, we have a great creator, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's a great privilege to be able to walk with him and let him uh, meet our needs and just the Christian life in general. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And today... We're going to be looking at the story, to a degree, of the man by the name of Moses. I'm going to assume that most people this morning listening are familiar with the man Moses, the great lawgiver, and every law in the world, regardless of where it's at, uh, what the state is, what the country is, every law in the world borrows from that which God had divinely given to Moses for the nation of Israel, which is actually found in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. But we're going to be talking today about Moses and something that we see about his life that is very important in our lives as well, or at least can be if we make the right choice. Now, one thing about the man Moses, we know that he was a meek man. We know that he was a very talented man. He was schooled with the best of the schooling of that day, uh, being raised, no doubt, or adopted, as we would say, by Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh would have been the king of the entire world. Moses would have been underneath of the best of the teaching and the teachers and the scholars of that day. And he would have had the best of education. So he was a man that was very eloquent in the direct sense. Now, I do know that if we go back to the book of Exodus in chapter number uh, one, two, three, and four, I know there's a denial of this where Moses says he can't speak well and he can't do this. And this is when God is calling him to go back into the land of Egypt. I do get that. Uh, but, but although the Bible teaches us the very conversation that Moses would have had with God that day, uh, as God called him into going back into Egypt and leading God's people, Moses' people, Israel, out, <clears throat> Moses is also showing a side of him that is very unique and wonderful and gives explanation of why he was so blessed and used of God. Moses was a very humble man, and this goes along with being very meek. So when Moses says, oh, who am I? I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, he was a strong man. Uh, we do know that there was a time when he was living as the so-called daughter of Pharaoh, that he seen two Hebrews striving one against another. And uh, he made mention to them, why are you doing this to one another? You guys are brothers. Brothers shouldn't be fighting with one another. Brothers should be defending one another. And uh, the one Hebrew said, uh, who made thou a judge over us? Do you intend to kill one of us as you did the Egyptian? And so it was just the day before that Moses had seen an Egyptian doing a Hebrew wrong, and Moses killed him. And when Moses heard that this got out, he ran and took off, not fearing the king, okay? Don't don't think that he got scared there and weak. He he left for other reasons, but the Bible says he was not he did not leave because he feared the king of Egypt or Pharaoh. There's other reasons for that. And he spent 40 years out in Midian, and in them 40 years, God was uniquely dealing with him and back in Egypt, uniquely dealing with Israel and preparing them for deliverance, which while Israel and Egypt is being prepared for deliverance through their cruel, hard bondage, God is preparing Moses and Midian for 40 years 
to be a leader to lead them out of that bondage. Wonderful, unique, sovereign work of God. Just a wonderful thing. So we learn a little bit about Moses here, and I want to look into his life uh, to a degree of what we find the Hebrew writer, which was Paul the Apostle, stating in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse number 23, and we're just going to read to verse 26. Now, you ought to read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We call it the Hall of Faith, not the Hall of Fame. We're not interested in the Hall of Fame. Uh, We call it the Hall of Faith. Now, although there are people in the hall of what we may call the hall of fame and different categories that have added and contributed something very positive to society. It's a blessing. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about something who has added, somebody who has added by what they have done, something to the spiritual life that has no ending. So the Bible says, by faith, Moses, now note why and how Moses operated. He operated by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments or his commandment. And that would have been to destroy the firstborn males of the Israelites And if the Israelites went against Pharaoh's command, not only would their male child be killed, but they would be killed. Well, you see that Moses' family wasn't too concerned about Pharaoh, was they? By faith, again, verse 24, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. (laughs) Now, there came a time in his life When he learned the truth about his life, that his mom, Jochebed, had put him in a river and um, that Pharaoh's uh, daughter was bathing herself with her accompanied uh, women who would have worked with her, appointed to her, her maidens. And uh, they seen the little basket floating down the river and they heard the child cry and Pharaoh's daughter sent for it and picked it up, and Pharaoh's daughter said, this is a Hebrew child, and she would have known that by the by the, the, the clothing or the cloth that Moses would have been wrapped in. And Pharaoh's daughter took Moses up, and Moses' sister, Miriam, is watching from afar off. <laughs> it's a wonderful story. And when Miriam, as a young teenage girl, seen her brother Moses be picked up by Pharaoh, she, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, that is, she ran over there and told Pharaoh's daughter, I know somebody who can nurse this baby. And guess who it was? It was Jochebed, Moses' mother. So he was nourished there, but yet raised under the roof of Pharaoh. And he came to a time where he understood the real truth of how all this worked out and how God had spared him. And it came to a place where he said, you know what? I'm no longer identifying as being the son of Pharaoh. And he came to a place in his life where he realized that was not the truth of who he was. That was not the truth of who he was. What does it take for you and I? What does it take for people to come to a place in their life where they realize really who they are and what their life is to consist of and what their life is about and why they're created? What does it take? Well, Moses came to this place about 40 years old, it seems, and he said, you know what? I'm refusing this. I am not Pharaoh's daughter's son. I am not an Egyptian. I am not a pagan. I am a Hebrew. I have a God that I serve. He is the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm no longer going to identify like this. So by faith, he did this. He believed the scriptures. He believed uh, what had been verbally and traditionally passed down, inspired, no doubt, and and, um, and told from generation to generation to generation. He understood his lineage and he understood what God had promised and covenanted with Abraham, which Moses would have been part of. And he accepted this by faith, the same way you and I accept it. So let me read verse 24 again. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now, what I want to speak about is this this morning. You can only enjoy sin so long. Sin is seasonal. You can only enjoy your sinful living so long. Sin is seasonal. Okay, so seasonal, what comes to mind? Well, we're going to be coming in the spring. For me, I think of, we're all different, aren't we? I mean, we're all different. But uh, for me, I think of spring turkey hunting. I'm a traditional bow hunter. I've been very blessed to be able to to, to harvest and hunt a lot of different species. And I think of uh, springtime. I think of, um, of preparing for my deer season to come up on our farms that we own, we have. Uh, well, my father has, I don't have. And uh, my other farms that I have privileges to hunt. And then I think of spring turkey hunting. And then, of course, summer comes along. And then that changes, changes uh, the springtime to a different time, the fall, fall time, and then the winter time. And of course, this repeats itself. I'm just saying that each season has different characteristics. Some seasons are very, very, very cold like it is now. Some are extremely hot. Some are just right. Each season has their own looks. The winter, uh, you know, we think of snow and we think of all the trees being barren in the fall. We think of all the beauty here in the Midwest of the different colors that God has put on creation with the trees and the leaves. And then in the springtime, we think of everything coming up very green and beautiful and such. Each season has their own looks. And let me just say that each season has its own season. What do I mean by that? Well, you get three months of spring, you get three months of summer, you get three months of fall, you get three months of winter. Typically, that's how it goes. Now, many things in life are seasonal, are they not? I mean, maybe your hobby today isn't what it was 20 years ago. Maybe it is. I've always kept my hobbies Really, I just looking back on my life, even as a Christian, I've kept my hobbies very, very, very few. And um, what I enjoy, I enjoy. As most pastors enjoy things that I don't. And that doesn't make me right and them wrong or them wrong and I'm right. That doesn't, doesn't mean that. Um, but we just got different characteristics about us. But I mean, I don't like to golf. A lot of times when I go to pastor's meetings and it's a week meeting or whatever have you, they got Monday planned on golf. And I'm thinking, you can count me out. I'm not interested in putting on them. Sh- I'm not interested. I'm just, I'm not, count me out. What are you going to do? Well, I'll stay at the hotel and read my Bible if I need to, or I'll go to the local Harley Davidson shop and I'll look at the new motorcycle engine and I'll look at new designs and think about the mechanics of them. Um, something of that nature. Or if there's an archery shop in the area, a traditional shop, uh, I may go there, introduce myself. And I've done that throughout the years and I've been able to been, be taken in the back and and uh, depending on where I'm at in the, in the United States of America, and I've been taken in the back and showing how the machines work and show the different workings of different things. And so hobbies can be seasonal. And, I, and they are seasonal. I mean, they are seasonal, but hobbies can be seasonal. You know, there's a time for boating. And, you know, you, you, you do that not in the winter when there's ice on the river, do you? Well, what about health? You know, health is seasonal. There comes a certain time in the year, typically, everybody starts getting red-eyed and sneezing and migraine headaches because because of the pollen in the air, and and health can be seasonal. And then this time of year, oh, you got to be careful with the COVID, they say, and you got to be careful with this and that, and um, you know, I, I understand all that, and I get all that. They're seasonal. Our homes are seasonal. They are seasonal. I mean, our kids grow up, they crawl around the home, and then they go from crawling around the home to walking around the home. Then they go from walking around the home to leaving the home and getting their own home. Homes are seasonal. And so hobbies, they change to a degree because they're seasonal. Health changes, no doubt. In fact, of the matter is, uh, our health is always changing and homes change. But I'm going to tell you something, God don't change. 
God don't change. I'm, I would be leery of these churches nowadays who say, well, we got to get with the modern day program. Boy, I tell you what, you better be careful when you hear that. When you walk into a church and they got the full band like Motley Crue and the men up there singing have got hair longer than the women and they're doing this and they're doing that. My friend, I just would tell you to be careful about that. You have liberty to do whatever you want to do. And then the smoke starts to come up and the lights start to go down and the pastor comes up and, and gives some kind of basically what, what it amounts to. He comes up and gives a motivational speech, not preaching, not preaching, not confrontation with sin and life. But God don't change. You say, well, that's old fashioned, Brother Hart, you guys believing them hymns. No, they're called being biblical. The Bible talks about hymns in the book of Ephesians. The book of Psalms is an entire book of hymns. Hymns are an old fashioned. Well, that old-fashioned King James Bible, the King James Bible is an old-fashioned. The King James Bible is the word of God for today's English-speaking people. It's not old-fashioned at all. Now, there are some things that are old-fashioned. If you got a 1968 Camaro sitting in your garage or you got a 1950 Panhead, which I've had both. <laughs> I've had both. I've had a 68 Z28. I've had a 78 Z28. And I've, and I've had pan heads and chopper pan heads. And yeah, they may be old fashioned, old school with the technology and the design, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a change in a local New Testament church that is a change birthed off of modernism and humanism and not off biblical principle and value. Can I tell you again, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when somebody starts saying, well, the church needs a change. No, the church doesn't. See. Well, let me say this. If the church has got off track, yes, it needs a change. And it doesn't need to change to a certain man's philosophy. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the church needs to be a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-honoring God-loving church, just like we're told. But today we got a lot of people who want to be Christians and do their own thing. Modernism and humanism. And that brings change and pastors adjust to that if they indeed are called pastors. But God doesn't need to change. God does not change. The Bible says in the Old Chest, Old Testament, God says, I am God, I change not. You know why God doesn't change and God doesn't need to change and we don't need to change what God's given us? Because God is perfect and change is not needed. You and I are not perfect. Change is needed. The word season or seasonal, it means to time of some continuation, but not long. Time of some continuation, to time, but not long. Meaning what you're doing is not going to last. Can I say that living sinful and living against the Holy Scriptures. You know, people, you know, they enjoy different things in their life, and we all have liberty to enjoy whatever it is you want to enjoy. Uh, the other day I was somewhere, and I noticed a man had all of his fingernails painted. Well, if he wants to paint his fingernails, that's his business. If he enjoys that, that's his business, not mine, amen. But I can tell you one thing, he ain't touching mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no way. Uh, and you know what? Um, when it comes to sinful living, you know, riotous living, what is sinful living? Well, it's it's things that the Bible's against. The Bible's against fornication. The Bible's against adultery. The Bible's against alcohol. The Bible's against liquor, hard liquor, soft liquor, however you want to put it. The Bible is against vices. The Bible is against pride. And, and, and the word of God teaches very clearly that God is not mocked and that your sin will find you out. The Bible makes it very clear. If we cover our sin, we'll not have mercy. But if we confess it, we will have mercy. Some sin brings sharp rebuke right behind it with really a premature death. There is a sin unto death. Some sin is not so. It depends on God and the individual's heart dealing with repentance and faith. 
But God is perfect and we are not. Therefore, God's word is perfect because the Bible, the King James Bible, now I'm not talking about these other things. The King James Bible itself teaches us itself and stands up for itself that it is God's word and it is perfect. And the King James Bible is perfect for today. And listen, it is the word of God for today's English speaking people. We don't need to change to another version, although this King James Bible is not a version. It's a translation from Hebrew and Greek. Everything off of the King James is a version, and they should be avoided because there is serious, serious change, and you need to read it enough to know that. The story before us, Moses, we find, had a very unique birth, and he was spared from a public abortion. In verse number 23, by faith, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. The king's commandment was all male children were to be aborted that were Israelites because they were growing, that is the nation of Israel, at such a rapid pace that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, recognized that if he did not do something to slow this down, that they could rise up and overcome the Egyptians and take their empire or their kingdom from them. There's a partial truth with that because out of Israel, one day is going to come one out of the tribe of Judah named Jesus Christ. And you mark my words, dear friend, he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. And for those that laugh and scoff, you have liberty to do that now. But you won't do that one day. I'm going to say this again. You can only enjoy your sin so long. It's seasonal. You know, everybody wants to boast on their drinking and, and how they, you know, how good last night was in the party. How do you handle that when that same thing you're looking down at the casket of somebody? Are you crazy? Everybody wants to enjoy their high from their heroin or their methamphetamines or their legalized marijuana. And they laugh and say, oh, this is so good. Is it? Is it so good? How do you handle looking down at the casket? How do you handle going to the hospital when something disastrous and destructive has happened from that? You can only enjoy sin so long. It's seasonal. Don't you be fooled by this. I don't care what anybody else tells you. I'm telling you what the Bible tells you in the strict sense of I'm trying to help you. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. Oh, it may be fun now, but it's seasonal. And Moses, we see here in verse 23, had a unique birth. He was a goodly, proper child. He was not aborted. He was spared from a public abortion. And his mom and dad had prayed and turned him over to the will of God, made a little ark, put him in the river, and just let him float down the river. And he happened to wind up in the very lap of Pharaoh's daughter and was raised as such. Very unique birth. Now, as time progresses, you know, he's 40 years old, give or take. You know, when he was come to years, he started to learn who he really was. Moses found out what was really right and wrong in life. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, right and wrong can be of the carnal thought, meaning you have liberty to choose what you think is right and wrong, but remember the foundation and the fundamentals of what's wrong is in the Bible, the Word of God. It is where it all starts. And as time progressed, Moses found out that he was in the wrong place as the right person. In other words, he understood that he was an Israelite. He was a child of God, but he was in the wrong atmosphere, Egypt. And the fact of the matter is, it says here that in verse 24, when, it come, when he come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said, I'm not identifying with you no more. That's what Christians do when they're saved. Bible, biblical Christians Biblical Christians ain't out on the tavern on Friday night. Oh, it's all right to do this and that. Biblical Christians ain't living like the world. That's not biblical Christianity. That's a carnal Christianity, if it is even Christianity at all. You're saying you're being a judge. No, I'm not being a judge. I'm giving you a warning. You can only enjoy your sin so long. It's seasonal. I'm helping you here. And you know this if you've lived long enough to see what the results of sin is. 
And Moses identified with God's people rather than the world. Verse 25 says, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Well, they mock the church. They laugh at Christians. They criticize the pastor. Well, go on. We ain't going to lose no sleep over you. We, we'll go home and take an Advil and go to bed and we'll sleep real good and get up the next day and live the life. You want to criticize it? You want to mock it? You want to laugh about it? You want to put it down? Go on. We're not coming over on your side. But you ought to try what we're doing over here and you'd understand why we are over this side. That is the side that is with God's people rather than the side that's of the world. I've been where you're at. You know, the world wants to tell us that it's having a good time. It lies to me. It lies to me. I can look out my window and I can see the families. I can see the life. I can read the news. That's a gigantic lie, friend. It's a lie. The world wants you and I to think that it's where it's at. It's a lie. Look at it. I'm not saying the church is perfect and we've got it all figured out, but we sure ain't caught up into that mess. Not Listen, real biblical Christianity is not caught up into that mess. Real biblical Christianity, Bible Christianity is not caught up into that nonsense. And Moses identified with God's people. There was a time in my life I had to realize that. I had to realize who I was, where I was at, where I was living, what I was doing, what I needed to identify, and I had to make a choice. And I chose. And when I chose, oh, I heard Joe got religious. He must have got scared or he must have got spooked. And I lived the life of sin. There's no doubt about it. But I can guarantee you I didn't go to church because of a man. I'm not afraid of any man walking the face of this earth regardless of who he is. And and, and my and, and, and I'm not a, a, a tough guy. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I fear God. I'm not a tough guy at all. But I'm just saying I don't fear anything about man. Um, you know, regardless of who he is. And I wouldn't expect the same from me to another man. I would say, don't fear me, fear God. Fear God. And Moses came to this place in his life where he identified with who he really was. And I'm talking to people today. Your mom and dad raised you in a good Baptist church. You were once serving the Lord. You're saved. You've been scripturally, biblically baptized, and you're out of church. You're not living right. And listen, you can only enjoy this life so long, friend. It's seasonal. If you're not already being dealt with by God with some sort of of chastisement, it's coming because God loves us. And Moses chose Jesus Christ. He chose God over Egypt. Verse 26 says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than that of the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the world. Moses chose God over the world. When you talk about serving the Lord Jesus Christ, now listen, when we talk about serving Jesus Christ biblically, there is a reproach because there's carrying a cross. And by the way, serving the Lord is not seasonal. It never ends. It's a good life. It's the best life. It's the abundant life. It's the life of peace. It's the life of joy. It's the life of purpose. Eternity will prove this in heaven. But rejecting Jesus Christ and thinking, oh, I don't want to mess with that, that, and thinking it's a reproach, and look at all the treasures I've got. Yeah, friend, listen, there'll be no reward when you die. You'll wind up in hell. You will wind up in the eternal lake of fire. And if your family is that way, your kids and your family will wind up there too. Now, this is what the Bible clearly teaches. Listen carefully. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Moses had to think about this. If I leave my identification from being the son of the daughter of Pharaoh, I am going to be reproached. I am going to be ridiculed. I am going to be scoffed and mocked. But if I do identify with Moses, Excuse me, that is, if Moses was to identify with Pharaoh's daughter, he set the rest of his life. He chose to take the reproach because it's the right way than to enjoy the treasures of Egypt, which you don't take with you. You came here with nothing. You will leave with nothing. You and I, Regardless of who it is, we can only enjoy our sins so long. It's seasonal. The Bible says, for the wage of sin is death. 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, wherever you're at, whoever you are, if you can believe by faith that Jesus died for your sin on the cross, that he was buried in a grave, and on the third day he rose again, you can ask Jesus to save you today, just like the Bible says. Ask him wherever you're at today to come in your heart, forgive you of all your sins, save your soul, and give your life to him, and make a choice That if it's a reproach to serve God, that's fine. I'm serving God. But I'm not going to enjoy the treasures of Egypt for a season and wind up in the lake of fire. You can only enjoy sin so long. It's seasonal. My dear friend, our time is gone. I pray that you'd make the right choice with your life for God's honor and glory and for the future of your eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.